committee and we are continuing our discussion on H548, uh, cannabis establishments. And uh, we just finished a walkthrough with uh, attorney Michelle Childs and we are now joined by executive director of the cannabis board, Bryn Hare. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, um, good, good morning committee. Um, for the record, Bryn Hare, uh, executive director of the Cannabis Control Board. So nice to see you all again. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I am going to, before I dive into the bill, I thought I would give uh, the committee a little bit more background about what the board has been up to um, and how it developed some of the recommendations that you kind of see um, in the bill before you this morning. Um, so one of the um, one of kind of the key components of our enabling legislation was um, the development of an advisory committee. And I'm going to be referring to our advisory committee um, quite a bit this morning when I talk about uh, some of the some of the conclusions that the board reached. Um, so I wanted to give you a little background on who they are. Um, our advisory committee is um, has 14 members. And as I mentioned, our enabling legislation created them and tasked them with uh, assisting the board in implementing and administering the laws um, governing the adult use and medical cannabis market. So the 14 members, if you look at the makeup of these 14 members, you'll see that there's quite um, a breadth of expertise among them. Um, and we, because of our sort of late start of the board, um, the full advisory committee didn't get officially seated until about the end of July. Um, and in order to kind of meet our legislative timelines, we really had to get our proposed rules filed um, by November. So we had like a, a, a chunk of time here that wasn't very long um, to really uh, leverage them in the most useful way, get decision points in front of them, get them up to speed and, um, and really really use them to, to, help, uh, to help guide the board's work. So in between August and November, when we filed our first set of proposed rules, pre-filed them, um, we held about 75 meetings of our advisory committee um, and associated subcommittees. And the way we did it was to sort of split up um, the advisory committee members based on their area of expertise into subcommittees. And then we would um, put sort of the relevant decision points before these uh, subcommittees. And we had a consultant working with us who developed some sort of comparison charts with respect to what other states were doing and some outcomes in other states to help guide their work. Um, so we went through this process with our advisory committee. It was quite time intensive, um, but I do think it resulted in some, some good recommendations that the board relied on in developing um, our, our proposed administrative rules and some of the, some of the recommendations that, that are in this bill. Um, so I hope that provides a little bit of context for where, um, where some of our thinking, how some of our thinking has been guided. So um, with that, I'll just jump into the bill if that's what's most helpful, unless you want to start with like specific questions. Anybody have questions? No, okay. um, I'm okay. not seeing any. And um, after um, Michelle did the walk, I did... Uh, to tell committee members that um, my understanding from, from the board standpoint that is that this is really a more of a technical bill. And so as, as, um, as you go through it, if you could help us understand um, why the changes are really more technical as opposed to a substantive or, or you know, policy change. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Will do. <clears throat> so um, the section one, the first section of the bill, this is the um, section that amends the prohibited products list to remove that prohibition on solid concentrate products with a 60% or greater than 60% concentration of um, THC and to remove that prohibition on oil cannabis products. So um, the board has put forward um, several reports to the legislature in um, response to some directives in our enabling legislation. So I'll make sure that the committee has them available. Um, two of them, the November 1st report and our January 15th report contain some of the recommendations that um, relate to this section of the bill. So to set the stage a little bit, um, concentrates are really extracts that contain high amounts of cannabinoids. 
um, terpenes and other compounds that are found in the cannabis plant. And due to the high amount of cannabinoids that are in these concentrates, when the THC is extracted from the plant, the resulting solid or liquid concentrate is by nature going to be above 60% um, THC generally. Um, so one of the most common ways to formulate a cannabis product is by using um, some sort of concentrate, a distillate or an isolate or some other kind of concentrate. So using a full concentration um, product to make another cannabis product allows a product manufacturer to really kind of precisely calibrate how much THC is going into a product. So if these extracts that are 60% um, or greater THC are prohibited at any point in the supply chain, then licensees are gonna to need to adulterate them with some kind of additive to dilute the quantity of THC that's contained in the concentration before the extract can be added to another cannabis product. So if, um, if you're thinking about a baked good, that's a good way to think about it. So cutting like a natural, natural THC concentrate with another product with an adulterant um, could make the end product more dangerous or, um, or harmful to the consumer at the, at the end stage. Um, so these are products that are currently widely available in Vermont um, yeah, on the illicit market. Um, they're also widely available in other out-of-state markets. And they also um, constitute a pretty high percentage of the market in other states. So for example, in Massachusetts, the legal regulated adult use market, um, high, con high concentrate THC products account for about 20 to 30% of the market share. So um, all that is to say that prohibiting them really will cause the unregulated illicit market for them to thrive. Um, and leaving the manufacture and sale of those products outside of the Cannabis Control Board's control um, could really wind up being harmful for consumers in the, in the long run because consumers will be purchasing them on the illicit market. Um, and those manufacturers won't be subject to um, the regulations that the Cannabis Control Board has put forward. Um, so they, they will be unregulated. They will, um, the extraction of these products often uses uh, solvents and that's part of what uh, the bill talks about, I think in section five with the butane and the hexane. Um, so some solvents can um, pose health risks if they're used improperly um, or if they are not filtered properly out of the final product. Um, so leaving it, um, leaving these products sort of on the unregulated market could ultimately um, pose potential health risks for consumers. And also consumers may be unaware of these health risks um, that are involved in consuming products with, um, that could have residual solvents in them. And also um, they could be unaware of the potential health risks, risks of consuming products with a high concentration of THC. So um, as the committee is aware, the Cannabis Control Board has um, a whole host of regulations that it's required to put forward that govern um, the packaging of products and the labeling of products and um, the required health warnings that will have to be distributed um, when consumers are purchasing a product at a retail establishment. Um, in addition, unregulated facilities that aren't inspected Oh, um, yep. Yeah, there's a couple second delay, so it can create some confusion sometimes. No, around the packaging, I'm just wondering if the uh, if that's done by by rule, as far as what's on the labels. Yep. So there's um, our enabling legislation had some requirements for us about what we're what the board is directed to do in, with respect to rulemaking around packaging. Um, so the board, has, like, as I mentioned at the outset, the board has pre-filed some proposed rules, um, including rules surrounding what the packaging has to look like, what is required um, to be included on the packaging. Okay. Thank you. And I'm happy to uh, send the committee links to those proposed rules if you're interested in reading them. So, um, just to carry on, the, an, another reason um, that these products shouldn't be prohibited is that um, allowing them to continue to thrive on the illicit market will mean that um, these unregulated facilities that are processing and manufacturing them aren't going to be inspected or permitted, and therefore they're going to operate at an increased risk 
um, including posing potential harm to first responders. Because as I mentioned, um, creating these distillates and concentrates, um, one way, of, there's many ways of creating them, but one way of creating them is using a solvent-based extraction. And some solvents um, can be highly flammable. Um, they are often under pressure. Um, so part of the regulations that are going to apply to product manufacturers are regular inspections. Um, there's fire safety will be involved in ensuring that people are operating their equipment safely. Um, and the board will be regularly conducting inspections of these facilities. So under, the, under our, the board's authority, the manufacture and sale of these types of products would be subject to all kinds of um, standards, including, as I mentioned, the facility inspection, fire and building safety code, um, what types of solvents would be allowed for use in extraction, um, and then threshold like maximum amounts of residual solvents that would be allowed in uh, products that ultimately go to consumers. There will also be consumer education requirements, as I mentioned, um, health and safety, warnings that will be um, handed out to consumers when they purchase these products. And ultimately it will just result in sort of a safer process for manufacturers and cleaner and safer products um, for people who use them. Um, and another, uh, another, another one of the board's rationales for not prohibiting these products is um, one of our, our advisory committee had a sub, one of the subcommittees of our advisory committee um, was looking at the social equity aspect of the cannabis market. And um, they came to the conclusion that the prohibiting these high THC products kind of further perpetuates the illicit market, as I've mentioned, and also the risk of increased arrests for cannabis offenses. Um, and as this committee well knows, there are racial disparities for drug arrests and sentencing, and those racial disparities persist um, even to this day. And to continue to prohibit these high THC cannabis and cannabis products asks um, communities of color to bear the burden of that uh, biased enforcement. And I will send, um, I see a question, I'll hold there. Go ahead, I, I was gonna. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna. Your thought, and then I'll I was, ask I was just gonna, okay. I was just going to say that I'll send the, um, I'll make sure that Amber has links to our, our um, legislative reports. So you can see um, the recommendations that we've put forward there. Uh, I was just wondering as far as the, uh, you know, things like butane and hexane, if there's any information on how much it's, it's used in the illicit, illicit market now. So, I don't know. I mean, I think that's a little bit hard. That's a little hard for the board to know how how um, how frequently it's being used in the illicit market. It is, yeah. as you know, um, prohibited in Title 18. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not being used. <laughs> but I right. do understand that the um, that currently the medical dispensaries typically don't use these type of extraction methods. Um, there are, as I mentioned, there are solvents, there's ethanol and CO2 that um, are not prohibited and that I think are more frequently used um, by the dispensaries as well. Thank you. Sure. So if there, I'm happy to um, answer any other questions on that section or I can move on to section two. Wait. We can keep going, thank you. Section two, please. Okay. Sure, so the section two, this is the section that um, amends the directive to the board regarding um, its rule rulemaking requirements. Um, so the first part was the um, provision that allows, sort of explicitly allows um, products to contain both CBD and THC. And um, our advisory committee did work on this issue um, and give us a recommendation on this. So there is sort of an interactive effect of uh, CBD and THC in the same product. And there have been some studies showing um, sort of a, a demonstrated positive uh, impact of CBD in combination with THC. The Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission recently like completed sort of an extensive review of the existing data um, on potency limits in THC products and the combination of CBD with THC in cannabis products. 
and concluded that there are some studies that show um, a positive health benefit associated with combining the two. Um, but the evidence, they, they concluded that the evidence really isn't sufficient to require minimum levels um, or minimum ratios of CBD. Um, so it wasn't the recommendation of our advisory committee that we require a minimum level of CBD to be included in Canvas products. Um, but also they didn't want uh, the board to, they didn't want it to be prohibited either. So um, essentially uh, there is very little um, comprehensive data about uh, the effects of cannabis because of its, uh, because it's a schedule one substance at the federal level. But there are some studies out there that show that there's positive health benefits um, by including T CBD with THC. So, um, this is, there's recommendations about this specific uh, portion of the bill in our November 1st report, and I'll make sure the committee has a link to that. I do see a, I do see a hand. Yeah, I had a quick question if that's okay. It's, sure. um, this is like purely anecdotal, but it's my uh, understanding that often in, products that combine sort of THC and CBD, you'll, you'll often see a lower THC level. So it, it seems like some of those products are designed for folks who want overall benefits with maybe like less of the psychoactive experience. Do you think that's a fair <laughs> characterization? I, it just, it seems like that's what I see. Yep. And I, I do think <clears throat> They, these kind of products are popular with consumers in other states. Um, and because they're, you know, whenever you have a product that's, that is, that consumers are enjoying, um, prohibiting it or limiting it without evidence that it's particularly harmful, um, we'll just keep more sales in the illicit market where products are, are unregulated and untaxed and not subject to the regulations of the board that are going to include quality assurance. Thanks. Okay. So is it, so sh shall I move on to section three? This is the section that allows the, um, the employee ID cards to kind of run with the employee instead of the employer. Yes, thank you. Okay. So oh, um, this one is pretty straightforward. That I think that it was the underlying legislation um, was a little bit unclear about whether um, an employee ID uh, an employee would have to actually secure employment with an um, with a cannabis establishment prior to getting an ID card. Um, and so this request is really kind of a technical one that um, ensures that employees are able to seek an employee ID card from the board um, prior to seeking their um, employment with an employer. So that way an employee with an ID card could really move them um, about the industry um, and seek employment where they, where they wish. And since um, this is kind of a whole new industry, there's, there are going to be some types of employees where it might make sense for them to um, work for one employer and then go and work for another one without being restricted or tied to one specific cannabis establishment. Okay. Not seeing any questions, thank you. Okay. Um, so section four, again, I, we, the board sees this as really a technical amendment. Um, the underlying, the enabling legislation that sort of set out the, the licensing framework initially contemplated that um, there was kind of a one license rule, which meant that um, anybody who is seeking a license wouldn't be able to get multiple license types for any one type of cannabis business. So um, essentially you couldn't have like a franchise of retail establishments or something like that. Um, and it applies to every, di every different type of cannabis establishment, um, which also includes testing laboratories. Um, so testing laboratories are going to be one of the first types of cannabis establishments that are eligible to receive a license. Um, the board is scheduled to open up our first window to accept applications in April, um, and that will be from integrated licenses, small cultivators, and testing laboratories. Um, and they're going to be one of the first licenses available because they're going to serve a really critical role in the functioning of the regulated market. Um, testing facilities are going to be testing cannabis and cannabis products for um, pesticides, mold, 
um, adulterants, residual solvents, THC levels, kind of a whole gamut of things. Um, they're going to be, essentially they are, they're gonna be providing um, information to ensure that the products that hit the shelves in the retail shops are safe for consumption and to make sure that people have really comprehensive um, knowledge about what is contained in that product. Um, in other states that have, that have stood up an adult use cannabis market, um, many of those states initially had insufficient lab facilities available. Um, which resulted in bottlenecks in the supply chain that um, delayed the opening of the market and, result, and often also resulted in product shortages. So if um, testing facilities, the testing facilities that are here now and the testing facilities that open um, once the adult use market is available, um, if they're able to achieve some efficiencies by obtaining additional licenses and therefore having additional locations, that would really only serve to improve um, the functioning of the market because it will mean that our the products will be able to move more quickly through the supply chain and get tested um, before they are allowed to um, be available for purchase. So we so kind of, yep. with, with testing facilities, so it, it's one license, one location? Correct. Okay. So if somebody wanted to have multiple locations, would they be able to apply for another license if they wanted to have one in Southern Vermont, one in Northern Vermont? That's the idea, yes. And that okay. was also the idea in the original legislation was to not allow that for cannabis establishments. But I, the, I think that the legislative intent there was to not allow that for the cannabis establishments that are creating products um, and putting them out on the market. Um, the testing labs are really serving a different purpose, a, a critical purpose, but um, a, a little bit different than the other cannabis establishments. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, Brenna, I hate to go backwards, but I was trying to formulate my head how to ask this question here. In reference to the cards that are that are uh, issued to ident identification cards, yep. do you have a, a mechanism in place uh, when an employee uh, chooses to leave voluntarily to go as far as tracking the reasons why, whether it's like a, for lack of a better term, an honorable discharge from one facility, they go to another facility. Is there a mechanism in place for that? So I don't, I'm not sure there's a, there's a mechanism for it, but the board does have to undergo um, a review process of every employee before they'll issue an employee ID card. Um, and that is that ID card has to be renewed on an annual basis. So um, there are there there the board will be conducting a review of of individuals who are looking to to have an ID card and it includes a background check and it includes some other um, some other uh, review by the board and I can certainly share some of that information if you'd like. Well, maybe I wasn't clear in my question. Once oh. they've obtained their ID, ID card and they have left employment from one facility and have moved to another facility, is there a following mechanism as to why uh, they left that facility? Were they honorably discharged and just chose to go for various reasons? Uh... Yep, I see what you mean. So no, I don't think that the board would necessarily be involved um, if, there, if a employee chose to move from one um, establishment to another. But as I mentioned, the board does have to have to renew a, an employee ID card every year. Um, so they, the board will be conducting a, some type of review on an annual basis. But I do think that um, kind of in between that year that the, I think Michelle mentioned that it would really be um, the same kind of principles that would apply in any other industry for employees. Okay, thank you. Uh, excuse me. I, I... <laughs> I do see that the hand of one of our witnesses is, is up, perhaps. Do you have something to, to add here? And then also um, Representative Christie has a, a question, so. Thank you um, for the record. And before we move on, I didn't know how you want to do this. And I apologize to Bryn for interrupting, but uh, Terry Jaguar, Agency at Ag, um, did participate in the advisory committee um, over the summer, but the lab piece, I just wanted to sort of lessons learned from the hemp program as we were certifying and licensing labs. Um, not all labs 
if they have multiple locations, they might do one type of analysis at one facility and a different type of analysis at another facility. So for instance, we have a lab registered that's Endine Labs and they do their cannabinoid testing here in Vermont, but the um, bacteriological testing takes place at another facility offsite. So they wanted to be able to do that under one license. And we just let the board know lessons learned from licensing hemp, hemp labs. So I just wanted to provide the background while it was pertinent. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Christie, go ahead, Coach. Thank you, Gary, that was very helpful. Hi, Brent, good to see you, even though it's in a different environment. Um, this is a, a question. Uh, so these ID cards are similar in a sense uh, to a, uh, like a teacher license, you know, uh, in a way. Uh, there are reviews, there are processes that, that are in place. And it sounds like uh, that's what's going to happen here in a way. Am I on the right path there? You are, yes. <laughs> yes, you are. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself there. Um, I would say it may, it may not be as stringent as, um, as a teaching license, but there are requirements um, that the board is going to implement, including educational requirements, training requirements right. on a whole yep. host, of, um, host of different things before um, an employee can receive one of these cards. So yes, I think that is a, a, fair, a fair comparison. Great, because I, I did uh, uh, get some information from an organization in uh, California, Cookies, I think it's called, uh, and, and they, they, they've become national uh, and multi-state, and they've got some, uh, some professionals that work for them that are uh, like headhunted in a way, you know, and I guess that's the, the other part of the question. And that might be some of what uh, uh, Representative Norris was talking about, you know, in reference to, uh, let's say, I hear that a particular employee runs a particular sorting, you know, machine better than anybody else. And, you know, I want to try to attract that person, you know, to Vermont. Uh, he or she might be you know, licensed, you know, in another environment. Uh, but I think that's what's going to start to happen, you know, over time, you know, so it'll be good to know how that uh, uh, recertification process goes. So just comment question at the same time. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, there is, there is a, a list of things that the application for one of these employee ID cards is going has to contain, um, and it includes um, a listing of of any other um, any other jurisdiction in which a, an individual worked um, to ensure that that information is being tracked by the board. Thank you. Okay. okay. Okay, so I'll carry on then. Um, so I think we're at section five now. Um, that this is the independent testing requirement for the integrated licensees, and I think Michelle um, really did a great job explaining this one. This is really a technical correction that um, that makes sure that those dispensaries have to comply with the independent testing requirement that applies to other cannabis establishments. Um, and I can't remember if there was a question about this one. Um, I apologize. I'm not remembering if, if somebody raised an issue here. I don't no. think so, but um, oh, I think people, uh, was there I did have okay. I, I did have a question uh, about independent, well, about this laboratory testing, but it's been answered. So. Right. Yes. Okay, that's right. Um there, yes, there is a, I think right now dispensaries are doing their, their potency testing in-house. Um, and I think that there's actually an interpretation of the rule that governs 
the um, dispensaries that they're not able to conduct independent testing because they're not able to transfer any cannabis products off site. Um, so that's really why we are requesting this sort of technical amendment. So to make sure that that independent testing requirement applies to everybody. And so okay. I'll move on to section six. Um, so this is ex removing that exemption um, for dispensaries that are regulated by DPS to use butane and hexane and making extractions. So we really see this as a technical change. Um, DPSs will no longer be regulating these facilities because um, they'll be under the authority of the board. And um, as I mentioned before, butane and hexane are, are really highly flammable hydrocarbons. Um, and they are solvents that can be used to isolate cannabinoids um, from the plant. And residual amounts can remain, as I mentioned at the outset, in these concentrated products. And it's difficult to know how much of that residual solvent will remain um, in a product that's operating off the regulated market. Um, so the idea here is really just to remove this language that provides the exemption for dispensaries because um, my understanding is that dispensaries aren't really using these uh, solvents in creating their extractions anyway. And also the board is um, creating some regulations around product manufacturers and what types of solvents will be allowed um, and also the threshold levels of residual solvents that will be allowed in the resulting products. Okay, uh, so the last, no, okay. Last section, the section seven, this is the provision that limits the amount of time um, that is that a dispensary can transfer cannabis and cannabis products to an integrated license. Um, and I think Michelle gave some good explanation of the origin, the how this language originated. Um, I think the idea here was to provide provide that because the retail establishments are scheduled to be opened in October um, to kind of ensure that there would be sufficient product available at the retail level. Um, I believe it was the legislative intent to provide that these existing um, integrated licenses that are have operations running could transfer um, cannabis and cannabis products that they had been cultivating and manufacturing to an integrated licensee um, for a period of time while the rest of the market kind of got um, established. Um, and so the recommendation here is to really just limit that amount of time. So um, the dispensary can, can transfer to integrated license, but not forever. Um, they can have this sort of initial phase where they can transfer to make sure that the, that the market is, has sufficient product tested and regulated product available um, when retail licenses are issued in October. Um, but moving beyond that, it doesn't make sense for, for dispensaries to have kind of an unlimited ability to transfer product to integrated licenses. So I think we're just trying to achieve the legislative intent there. Thank you. And that's yeah. Questions? Yeah. So Yes. So I apologize for coming in here late. Was the um, was there talk about this uh, twenty five year and older with a medical society concern? Was that talked about? Yeah. Can we go into that, or or we're going to wait on that till later? Or um, I'm, ha I'm yeah, happy to comment on that if you'd like. Um, sure. Quick comment because I do want to stick to the technical bill, but sure, go ahead. Okay, so the um, this would really apply to section one, and the board did hear the concern of um, the Vermont Medical Society regarding these high concentrate THC products um, and the impact on the developing minds of youth or developing brain. And the so the official recommendation of um, our advisory committee on this point was to limit um, the access of high THC products to individuals 25 years of age or older. So board did hear that concern and um, and that was the official recommendation of the advisory committee. That's not in here, is that? No, in. that's right. That would require probably some 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 additional drafting language. So at this point, that hasn't been proposed anywhere else. Then. 
not in a piece of legislation, just in our um, recommendations to the that have been put forward in our reports to the legislature. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tony had a question. Yeah, um, Bernard, questions around establishments. And, and I, I'd asked Michelle, and I think this is one of the questions that she suggested I asked you, but just wondering if somebody had a, a, you know, a warehouse and they divided it up into 10 different units, so to speak, and put a thousand foot uh, growing facility in each one, would they be able to rent those out separately? Yes, um, I think, I mean, I, I think Michelle did a good job of answering that as long as they are in compliance with um, with state and local law and also in compliance with the board's rules. And the board is um, has developed rules regarding co-locating cannabis establishments. Um, so I can send that to the committee. I can send our proposed rules and kind of highlight that portion if you'd like. There are, um, the board is sort of managing what a co-located uh, business would look like, um, specifically with respect to security requirements and other requirements that apply to individual licensees. Okay, thank you. And, and another question that came to mind was, say if somebody had an indoor grow facility, um, would they would they be able to have uh, an outdoor grow at the, on the same property as long as they weren't growing uh, inside and out and exceeding their license? Yep, so the, um, as, as Michelle mentioned, and as I've said a couple of times, the, our enabling legislation only requires that, um, or requires that everybody only be um, eligible for one type of each type of license, one license within each category. So um, the board was tasked with, with developing cultivation tiers. Um, so one of the tiers that the board developed is a, what's called a mixed cultivation tier, which allows for a cultivator to do cultivating indoors and also have a set number of plants that they can grow outside. Um, so the board has proposed in its initial, in its initial licensing um, framework recommendation um, that one of those that the mixed tiers be available. So there are currently the proposal in front of Ways and Means is three different um, mixed tiers with different sizes of indoor grow space and different numbers of outdoor plants. And I can give you more information about that if you'd like. But yes, they're required to be at the same lo location. So I, I guess I'm still a little confused. So. So if I had a thousand foot uh, license and, and, uh, and it's the winter time uh, and I, I'm, I'm growing inside obviously in the winter and, and I harvest that and, and spring comes, would, would I then just be able to move my thousand feet outside? Oh, I, I see what you're saying. So there is, um, if, if, you, if a cultivator gets an indoor, um, Gets a, gets a license type, they can get either an indoor license type where they can grow inside, they can get an outdoor cultivation license type where they can grow outside, or they can get a mixed tier where they can do some growing both indoors and outdoors. If you're growing okay, indoor, separate if you're- if you, It's separate licenses for indoor and outdoor? Separate licenses for in cultivation and outdoor, except for that mixed tier or mixed cultivation tiers, which allows you to have grow space both indoors and outdoors. Great, thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, Selena, and then we will uh, we'll move on. Our witness, sex witness. Go ahead, Selena. Thanks so much. Um, I have a couple of issues that I've been hearing about um, again and again that aren't reflected in this bill, but they might be reflected in others. So I was I was just going to ask you about them and to try to under in the context of the whole landscape of <laughs> recommendations are moving forward, if that's okay. Um, it's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just while we have you here, because, well, I'm just also trying to understand, you know, if there's, we need to think about anything else in the context of this vehicle. So one, I think is probably much more of a medical issue, although I did introduce some draft language on it after talking with James Pepper, and I know that it got referred to our committee. So I, um, and the issue is that folks who are participating in the total abstinence program to get their license reinstated after, after DUIs 
can be prescribed opioids, but they can't be medical marijuana users. And I think that's just come up a bunch of times. Is is that something that's moving through on the medical bill, you know? So that is not um, included in the medical bill. That language is not there. Um, it was, I do think that's an appropriate place for it, although it's not for, you know, you guys can decide what's appropriate for what. Um, right. So, but no, that is not current. That language is not currently in the medical bill that's in Senate Health and Welfare. Okay. And then um, the other issue is just, I've heard from a lot of different sectors of folks who uh, have are wondering um, the language around the actual, you know, revenue allocation for, for substance use disorder. The language is pretty narrowly tailored around prevention. And I think there's some folks who have an interest in, I've heard a lot of people wanting to expand that to make sure that treatment um, and related harm reduction approaches are also encompassed. And I don't know if that's something you all have heard about that's moving along elsewhere. So I have heard about that, but I am not aware that that is moving um, in another bill. I know that, as you know, the Ways and Means is looking at our fee structure. Um, so far, they have, they have not included anything about where the tax revenue is going. Um, and I'm not aware that that any, any more specific language is moving in any bill right now. Okay. I appreciate that. That's really so helpful. Thank you. And sorry that I, feel, I know that was a little off topic, but I'm just tr really trying to understand the bigger puzzle of what fits together and what should be in this bill as opposed to somewhere else. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm not seeing anything else, but thank you so much, Bryn. So good to see you. So we'll see Great you to see you. Well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll welcome back um, Carrie Dejer from um, Agency of Ag. Well, hello and good morning. Thank you for having me, committee. It's uh, been a few years and there are are quite a few new faces. Um, I, my background, when I started at the agency in uh, <clears throat> 92, I believe, it was as a chemist in our lab. So I've been asked to, to talk a little bit. And I also, my division houses the hemp program. And we're seeing a lot of these extracts and how they're how things are being extracted and what processes are being used um and i'm more or less here to support what the advisor advisory committee and the board have put forward to you about the concentrates and removing those limits um when some of these concentrates are made and the solvents are purged they will be above 60% generally, whether that's CO2, butane, or ethanol extraction, with ethanol sort of being the dirtiest of those and having the lowest um, THC concentration or CBD, whatever you're extracting. And to lower those concentrations, um, various things could be used. Um, and not all of them are, are necessarily uh, beneficial or, or all that great. And I believe when that um, restriction was put in place, there were news articles about um, folks uh, having an adverse impact or getting sick from illicit market uh, vape cartridges. Um, that was, you know, extracted uh, THC diluted with something other than a cannabinoid. So what it was believed to be diluted with was a vitamin E lanolin product, and that was making folks sick. Um, those products, to dilute the THC for those cartridges, they use uh, diluents from the um, tobacco vaping market. So it's vegetable glycerin, it's... Um, 
sort of different glycol solutions, whether it's propylene glycol or other solutions. And basically having that requirement that the THC be lower than 60%, um, depending on the product that's being made, you're almost encouraging these other compounds be in that product, which makes it a less, less if you will, healthy product. And I don't mean to use healthy in a way that suggests that <laughs> they're necessarily beneficial. That That's each individual's um, concern, but we would be encouraging the use of other adulterants in a pure product. And don't, don't believe that that's necessarily the way to go. And I'm here to support the, the board's decision to um, present that to you. Also available for any other, other questions, but largely um, Bryn did a wonderful job of capturing what uh, the board and the advisory panel um, would like to offer the legislature. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? I'm not, I'm not seeing any. Good to see you. Take care. Thank you. Okay, now we have our final witness with the Vermont Medical Society. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, committee, and thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Jill Satov Garen uh, with the Vermont Medical Society. I'm also representing the Pediatricians and the Psychiatric Association today. And um, we are actually here with a different opinion. Um, as you may have read from my testimony, um, we have been working with the Cannabis Control Board throughout the summer and the fall uh, to really make sure that evidence-based prevention strategies are included in the rollout of the retail market. Um, but we are pretty concerned about removing potency limits and specifically around these concentrates. Um, I just wanna say that uh, concentrates are really these very potent isolates and the, the isolating for the, the psychoactive component of cannabis. And what the average is for a lot of these concentrates that are used in the states that have legalized is around 45 to, no, sorry, 54 to 69%. That's the average for a concentrated product that might be used in a vaping device. Um, they can also be used in edibles as well, but uh, it, with a solvent-based product, you can get up to 80 or 90% THC. And just to put that in perspective, the, the um, marijuana that was prevalent in the 80s and the 90s that I grew up with um, was around one to 2% uh, THC potency. So you're really talking about a, a very large um, dose. And a lot of times if it's vaped, then it goes immediately into your body. Um, and so that can have a lot of adverse uh, effects. And what the evidence is showing from a lot of these legalized states and, um, and even states where it's not legalized um, is that the higher potency, uh, anything over that 15%, um, and this isn't for concentrates, I, I understand we're talking about what's in the statute, um, but is associated with more emergency department visits and those are for acute mental health issues. And so what we're seeing is psychosis, we're seeing suicide ideation and completion, unfortunately, we're seeing schizophrenia, and that's really um, more prevalent with consistent use of these higher potency products. And then you're also seeing some uh, very acute respiratory illnesses. And then this new syndrome that's come out um, with people that are using uh, more daily use of the high potency products is it's called hypermesis 
syndrome. And what that is, is a, an uncontrollable vomiting syndrome that stops when you stop using the cannabis. Um, and so we're concerned, particularly because there is a very low perception of harm with these products. And that I think stems back to our connotation of cannabis as being a natural product, as being a benign product. But when you isolate it and you make these concentrates, you really are making a high potent drug, we would argue that has a lot of impact. Um, and so in states where they have legalized, uh, we've seen that these concentrates can be as high as 90% and that they just, in order to be competitive, they keep raising these potency levels. And so we would say, hmm, this is you know something that we understand that the board feels like by bringing it into the regulated market, then they're, they're going to make it, um, you know, bring it out of the illicit market. But we would say you're also indicating to youth that it's safe and you're indicated to consumers that this is, this is benign. Currently, right now, we already have one of the highest uh, young adult use rates of cannabis. So there's about a 38% of 18 to 25 year olds use cannabis of some form. And then over COVID, this was exacerbated. And I did include a graph. This is a graph um, actually regarding tobacco, but it shows that over a quarter of Vermont's high school students vape. And out of those, 78% report that they vape cannabis. So, and then you also have the co-use that students who use cannabis are three times more likely to use other sorts of vaping products and then are likely to smoke cigarettes. So our concern is that by endorsing these high potency products, you're giving the, the impression that these are healthy products to use. And we, we hadn't, um, uh, really gotten anything about this, uh, raising it to 25 years old. Um, I don't have an opinion on that today, but we'll bring one back to you. Um, and um, just, just so I can follow in terms of section one in yes. your testimony on this bill. Am I understanding that you oppose the striking Yes. Of the language yes. in two. We oppose in, in yeah. striking the language on the, the potency levels of over 60%. OK, thank you. And part of that is that with all of the evidence coming out of the acute mental health issues related to high potency and other physical issues related to this by removing the, any having no potency limits we don't really feel like you're regulating a this this product that is is very potent um, and then in terms of the the section one regarding the prohibition of um, the oil-based THC products. We understand that the vaping had, with the THC oil has really driven a lot of adverse health impacts. And um, we know that uh, in the statute, there was an exemption for prepackaged um, battery powered devices because these were used by the users of the um, cannabis for symptom relief. And so we, we, we agree with what is in the statute and um, we really feel like there was these uh, 2,800, it's called E-Valley lung issues that were related um, as uh, Carrie was saying, uh, to this vitamin E acetate oil 
based THC products being used. Um, and so we are concerned and we would support the continued prohibition of the oil based cannabis products. Um, um, Tom, excuse me, I have a question before you move on to the other yeah. sections of the bill. How you doing, Jill? Hi, hi, uh, Representative Burdett. Just a question around the, uh, say if we do end up limiting percentages uh, as far as potency goes, I'm just wondering if any other states are doing that. As far as we know, and I would have to say it's anecdotal at this point, um, Vermont is the only one that has limits. Colorado was looking at putting in limits just this past year because there, um, there's just so many mental health issues that are happening among their youth and young adults population there. Um, and I don't think it passed. I think the industry um, was very strong um, there, but there was, it was, brought by um, a coalition of moms and prevention groups um, in Colorado. But other than that, that's the only thing I know and I can get you more information about that. That'd be great, thank you. Yep. Okay, any other hands? So, um, so in terms of the rest of um, 548. Yeah, so Section two, I'm not sure, listening to the way that Bryn described it, I'm not sure if we interpreted that right. Um, we had commented earlier this fall to the board on this idea of uh, prohibition of Delta-8 hemp products. And basically right now for a hemp product to be sold as hemp, it has to um, only contain 0.03% of THC. And so I thought what this, um, what 548 was trying to do was to bring in any of the hemp products that are isolated and have a higher THC profile, bring that into the regulated market under the cannabis THC um, program. And we would support that, that, that hemp products that have a higher THC profile, that they are sold as THC cannabis. Um, just in September of 2021, there was, I think, around 700 cases of adverse events because consumers didn't realize that there was going to be higher THC um, in these Delta eight is how they're labeled um, products and they are, they're vapes, they're gummies, they're chocolates. And so that drove people to the hospital. There was a CDC advisory put out around that. And so we do think that they should be regulated as a THC product. Um, and then we completely support the idea of the butane and hexane um, being used, I mean, being prohibited um, to be used to manufacture concentrated cannabis, um, not only uh, because it's highly flammable, but also we read a study um, that was looking at dab samples and they found that 80% of them had considerable residual solvent and pesticide contamination. Um, and then this, these butane, um, as Bryn was talking about, uh, the butane extraction is really being used at home to form these um, very highly potent products uh, that are being dabbed. Um, and so we do support that. And that's my testimony. Thanks for listening. Should we do have another question? Yeah, Jill, the, the 700 plus ad, adverse uh, um, situations, I guess, is that a, a nationwide number? Yes, sorry, that is a nationwide number. Um, and I can get you the advisory on that. It, I think that there was 39% uh, of those were actually underage youth, they were under the age of 18, um, with some of them being quite young because they didn't know that there was THC in these products because there was a, the assumption that it was just hemp. Um, so, 
Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. So that concludes our witnesses on this bill. Let folks think about if there's any more information, any, uh, if it'd be helpful to have Bryn or Michelle pick it up again. I still do have Michelle is here. Um, any other yeah, questions on the language? I'm good right now. Uh, Carrie? I, I just wanted to offer um, the agency through the hemp program did send a letter to our hemp registrants um, letting them know that in Vermont we did not consider Delta 8 products or Delta 8 uh, THC hemp. Um, some states have because it is made from hemp, it's a synthetic cannabinoid that uh, is processed from CBD isolate. And because of the THC concentration and the fact that it was psychoactive, um, we sent a letter to our hemp growers saying that producing Delta-8 THC did not fall into, under your hemp permit. And I can provide that letter to the committee if, if there's a desire to see it. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Great. Then why don't we adjourn for the morning and then um